Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea is a vibrant democracy, having successfully completed its transition from authoritarian rule since the late 1980s. At the same time, a number of laws and regulations dating back to the Pak Chung Hee era are still in effect. Libel and defamation laws in particular seem to be invoked by the authorities with increasing frequency. Critics argue the government is attempting to influence the public discourse and silence dissenters. One of them is Professor Pak Kyung Shin, who has been advocating freedom of speech and opinion in South Korea, especially online. He gracefully agreed to be our guest for this episode to talk about internet and press censorship, defamation and libel law, and the political environment of these measures. Professor Park is a lawyer and law professor at the Korea University Law School, the executive director of the PSPD Public Interest Law Center, commissioner at the Korean Communication Standards Commission, and one of the leading figures behind OpenNet, a non-governmental organization defending the freedom and openness of South Korea's internet. He earned his JD from the University of California at Los Angeles. Professor Park, welcome to Korea and the World. You can call me KS. I'll call you, you KS, awesome. You are a uh, renowned lawyer and professor. What motivated you to not just enjoy the benefits of that position, but to actively campaign for free speech in South Korea? Can you maybe tell us about your background? Well, I'm fully benefiting from the perks of professor because uh, one of the perks is uh, you can act like not being a professor most of the time. I'm joking, but uh, outside six hours of teaching requirement, um, you can pursue the goals that are uh, consistent with your values and your research. Part of that is sharing with others what I have learned as the result of my research. So why are you actively supporting free speech in Korea? Why is that your thing? Almost by accident. Uh, I think back in 2008, when the government jailed major broadcasting producers for producing a program that didn't agree with the government position on uh, mad cow disease communicability of uh, American beef. I thought that was wrong, but there were not many people providing effective argument against it. The government also put into jail people who are doing a consumer boycott against uh, some newspapers that were perceived to be too partisan-like pro-government, too protective of the uh, government policies. I thought that was wrong as well. And then there was a third instance where an internet pundit called Minerva, who made uh, accurate predictions about some of the investment banking firms' uh, collapse. He was put into jail for being too correct, for having too many followers. And all he we could call wrong in his conduct was make some minor factual inaccuracies in talking about the government conduct. Those are three of the many instances where freedom of press began to regress in Korea. Uh, since then, I thought uh, it was duty-bound for a professor to you know, share what I know about free press, free speech. Yes, it all started 2008. So um, did you step in personally? Did you, uh, I think you were also a lawyer to PD Notes. What was your first, I would say, major you know, act of... Um... I was not directly a lawyer to PD Notes, mm. but I did provide much of the arguments that were argued in court and also argued outside. Criminal defamation itself is uh, taboo in international human rights discourse. It has been more abused by the incumbent powers to suppress critics uh, or rivals than to protect the uh, reputation of innocent mm. Uh, then uh, it was uh, uh, used to protect the reputation of innocent people. The downside was so overwhelming as opposed to the upside that all human rights bodies uh, have recommended uh, abolishing it or putting it out of use as uh, many uh, major countries have done. And here we saw an instance where the South Korean government was using it exactly for the purpose that was warned against by the human rights bodies. Uh, we'll talk about these laws in more details uh, mm -hmm. after, but I just want to ask you, what is PD Notes? Um, I'm not sure all our listeners actually know what that program mm -hmm. is. PD Notes is probably or formerly the most famous 
investigative broadcasting investigative journalism piece. So you can compare it to, say, 60 Minutes uh, in the U.S. They ran a, a piece, right, that went against U.S. beef being important to Korea, and that is what started the controversy. Yes and no. The South Korean government made a decision to import uh, American beef of all age, and that decision came as uh, really unexpected to uh, a lot of people because uh, the country was not ready for uh, ready for taking many of the safeguards taken, for instance, by Japan and other countries about mad cow disease. Not even safeguards taken by the U.S. government uh, itself. So. Many people thought that there should be some more care taken. Now, I don't know how dangerous it is, I don't know how likely it is, but all PD Notes did was to give voices to the people uh, who thought that there is a risk there and the decision should not be so rushed as uh, the government did. Um, So in 2012, you yourself had to face um, charges, curiously for overstepping the boundaries of what counts as free speech. What brought you in conflict with the law back then? Well, I was a commissioner at Korean Communication Standard Commission, which is an internet censorship body. And the body deliberates upon postings on internet and decides to uh, take them down if it's uh, illegal. And here was uh, uh, pictures of a male uh, anatomy that didn't have any sexual connotation. It's an erect part that's uh, commonly seen in medical textbooks or sex education books. Parts uh, showing how to use a condom uh, will inevitably have uh, these pictures. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the commissioners wanted to uh, take it down, calling it obscene. And according to the Korean Supreme Court's uh, interpretation of uh, obscenity, I thought it is uh, not obscene because it's supposed to have uh, Word by word, the definition of uh, obscenity is very uh, similar to the uh, obscenity standard in the U.S. and in other parts of the world as well. Now, I I lost the vote, so it was taken down. But it's not because I didn't like that vote, but it's because I thought there was uh, something fundamentally structurally wrong with uh, how the censorship system was run. Number one. When the government decides to take down something, it will not notify the person who put it on. So if you're a blogger and have like 300 entries on it, you cannot monitor each of the entries every day. If some entries are gone, you'll never know. If you don't visit that page again, you might not know ever. This is secret censorship. The government cannot work in darkness when uh, acting against its own people. Uh, Number two, The commission says it's taking out illegal content, but that's not the standard they're operating upon. Actually, the law says the standard for taking down is what is necessary for promotion of sound communication ethics. Actually, that is the reason why the body down the content, not because it's obscene, but it's against their view of sound communication ethics. It's an amorphous standard open to abuse that's placed only on the internet and not on other media. If, if, if this, this, these pictures are taken down, the blogger will never know whether they are taken down unless he checks back on his entries all the time. So I thought I should keep a record of what's been taken down, so I put it on my blog. Mm-hmm. And then I wrote my analysis of whether it should be taken down or not. One of the citizens of South Korea decided that my posting which is a legal analysis of this other blogger's posting, was itself obscene. So I'm still on trial for that. I was cleared of all charges up to the intermediary appellate court. I'm waiting for the Supreme Court's affirmation of that. And who is appealing against you all the way to the Supreme Court? Is it directly? Okay, so directly from the government. Yes. Mm. Um, Did you face any other uh, opposition from the government or some form of, let's not say crackdown, but, you know, this kind of chilling effect? against your operations or activities? Personally, no. Uh, but there were many times that rank-and-file producers or reporters of a major broadcasting companies will contact me for comment or appearance on TV and later cancel for a reason that is, uh, was not really compelling. And there were times that 
again, rank and file uh, researchers and government sponsored think tanks or agencies will contact me for um, you know, lectures or participation in research projects. And then we later cancel for, again, reasons that uh, were not transparent to me. Other than that, I didn't face much. Korea is a democratic country, there's a little doubt about that. Yet the American NGO Freedom House ranks press and internet freedom in Korea as partly free in its annual report. How did this conclusion come about and do you think it's a fair assessment of the situation in the country? If Freedom House used the International Human Rights Treaty as a standard, I think they got it right. Now, who sets the international human rights standard? Back in the 1960s, uh, countries around the world entered into what's called the UN International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. That is the foremost international human rights uh, treaty governing not just Korea, the US, uh, most of the countries that uh, entered into the treaty. Now, according to the treaty, the Commission issues different recommendations, reviews different country practices, and gives uh, evaluations on them. Now, having done that for so many years, the Human Rights Committee, uh, not Commission, the Human Rights Committee, uh, were tired of uh, repeatedly issuing the same recommendations to different countries, so decided to issue what's called general comment, which is the first and right now only concrete set of uh, recommendations on how freedom of speech provision in ICCPR should be interpreted. There, the Human Rights Committee uh, said there should be no incarceration for defamation and criminal defamation is recommended to be abolished and there should not be prosecution for truthful statements uh, there should not be prosecution for opinions opinions that are not subject to verification of truth or falsity. I mean, that's the nature of opinion, mm. right? Korea violates each of these recommendations. Korea has a active criminal defamation practice. For a 20-month period back in 2005, the number of people who were incarcerated for defamation around the world was only about 200, and that number didn't include Korea, which mm. itself had about 50. So about 28% of uh, all people incarcerated for defamation were Koreans, not North Koreans, South Koreans. Or North Korea, uh, we didn't have stats. Uh, we have a law criminally prosecuting opinions. Uh, if opinions are housed in you know, not so cordial language, you can be uh, prosecuted for the crime of insert. And many truthful statements, if you can approve that you said that solely for public interest, you are also criminally prosecuted. So workers holding a picket sign, you know, uh, this employer didn't pay my wages, truthfully was criminally prosecuted and convicted of uh, defamation. I'm not surprised that uh, it now has received a partly free evaluation from Freedom of House. Can you maybe explain the difference between defamation, libel, seditious libel for those of us who do not have a, a legal background? Sure. Libel is uh, written defamation. Slander is oral defamation. Defamation is the term that includes uh, uh, both libel and slander. Uh, right now, we uh, a lot of times use uh, defamation for oral defamation because in the days of internet, what's oral and what's written, the distinction is disappearing. So this is libel is when defamation law is used by the government to put down what the government believes to be seditious. So a lot of uh, voices, contents, statements critical of the government can be put down by a seditious libel. And I must say, in Korea, we have a crisis of a seditious libel. And the crisis has uh, uh, begun in 2008 when PD Notes producers were uh, jailed for making this uh, program critical of the government agriculture minister's decision. And uh, recently, Bakunese regime is also prosecuting a Japanese reporter working for a Japanese newspaper for having written an article not critical, but suspicious of the government's link uh, with some shady individuals. Could you give us maybe some examples of famous libel cases, so to speak, a bit, uh, under the two administrations? 
I think one that comes to mind is uh, the National Tax Service whistleblower, 2009, who was also indicted. Do you have any other, you know, very strong example that, that show that this is used in a maybe political manner? Well, I think I just talk, talked about the two, PD Note case mm. and also Sankei newspaper uh, reporter case. Uh, I think both of them show, uh, both of them are the prime examples of seditious libel. How can we explain this massive use of libel in, in Korea? What is the objective and why, why is it so different here than in other countries which may also you know, be way more repressive but maybe use this weapon less? Well, as you know, Koreans are diligent. I think Korean prosecutors are being very diligent about the laws in the book. There are other countries that have a criminal defamation in books, uh, which, you know, in the books which can be abused by the prosecutors to protect the incumbent powers, but they are not used. I think that the uh, government still has not parted with the mindset back in 60s and 70s where they thought you know, for South Korean government to survive against the threat of North Korea invasion, we should uh, have a strong government, we should put the government before people, put unity before diversity, put solidarity before division. I think we have not really grown out of that. Uh, maybe that's the reason. So I, I think it's time for us to uh, you know, catch up to the idea that it's through diversity that we can achieve a stronger unity and uh, so solidarity. You mentioned PD Notes as one of the biggest cases of the few, last few years. Um, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Why did it go all the way to the Supreme Court? What was at stake? I think the prosecutors uh, and the government wanted to show that the millions of people out there demonstrating were actually misled by PD notes and that it's not their fault that people were out there uh, demonstrating. The point of going all the way to the Supreme Court is to create jurisprudence. Is there now a PD notes jurisprudence that is, you know, in your favor or in favors of those who want to defend free speech? Yes. Is it worth it, so to speak? Uh, well, it was worth on both sides. The prosecutors, uh, you know, having lost the first trial, went to the second, up to the, uh, and, and then again to the Supreme Court. By repeatedly appealing, the prosecutors achieved this everlasting cloud of chilling effects on investigative journalists in Korean broadcasting companies. If you are a TV watcher 10 years ago, you will know, I mean, you will feel like it's a different country. There are many programs going in depth on many government programs and practices, talking about costs and benefits, and we don't see them now. They began to disappear one by one, sometimes out of uh, volition, sometimes out of fear of retaliation. They began to disappear when PD notes uh, were being prosecuted. The People who are, including me, the people who are protesting uh, that prosecution uh, also won a good Supreme Court judgment or a set of judgments from uh, lowest to the highest that said that if uh, people are criticizing a government policy, it's the policy that's been criticized. We cannot use that as the basis for prosecuting someone for defaming the official that was responsible for the policy. For instance, the gist of the PD notes was that American beef may not be as safe as the Korean agricultural minister makes out to be. And you cannot take the statement, uh, I mean, maybe you can take the statement as defaming American cows, but you cannot take that as a statement defaming an official who thought that the beef was safe enough. So there's a, a strong chilling effect from that moment on until nowadays. Why the change? What, what, what happened between then and now? The producers, uh, to keep their positions, they gave up making transient coverages of uh, government programs or practices. The other thing that happened was the leading broadcasters in Korea are public, so the government can influence the appointment of uh, executives of uh, those entities. One by one, those executives were replaced with the people more pro-government than before. But why has this been this uh, government crackdown since 2008? Wasn't, why wasn't it the case before under other administrations? Is this a new trend or 
Has it always been the case? It's just that now it's more prevalent. It, it is a new trend. Uh, so this is libel is certainly a new trend. I don't know. I don't know. So you mentioned already your role at the Korea Commission Standards Commission. What is so you mentioned already the role of that commission? But what did the job entail, and why did you take the job, and what was the the atmosphere there? I took the job because uh, the opposition party members uh, specifically told me they nominate me because I can stand up for freedom of speech. That's why I took the job. We have uh, weekly meetings, uh, two weekly meetings, and we are supposed to review like thousand or two thousand postings at each meeting and decide which one should be taken down or not. Is that humanly possible? It's not. So a lot of times we'll have to rely on 40 other full-time employees of the commission who make recommendations. Now, what is the atmosphere in that uh, commission? I think you wrote in one article that a lot of members see themselves as fatherly figures and so they have to, you know, somehow be righteous, do the righteous thing. Yes. Is that yes. fair? Yes, the commissioners uh, see themselves as uh, guardian angels of uh, the people who might be harmed by uh, unruly, offensive uh, contents uh, on the net. What do you think of the government's plan to outlaw anonymity on the internet, the idea that everyone should use their, their real name? You know that that has been struck down as unconstitutional. Mm. Actually, uh, that will be uh, one, of my, I mean, one of the achievements that I'm most proud of. I uh, conceived and organized uh, the lawsuit against online uh, real name law and also provided most of the argumentation against that. I think that it is, uh, I mean, right to anonymous communication uh, is uh, fully established in law uh, around the world. Many of the most critical voices that contributed to the uh, advancement of human civilizations around the world were anonymous. Federalist papers at the founding of the U.S. Mm. Uh, was anonymous. Many of uh, independence uh, activists during Japanese colonial regime, the democracy fighters under military dictatorship period, they were anonymous. And I'm very proud of uh, that decision because of what the court added to my argumentation. The court wrote in the decision, Internet is the only medium where people can break free from hierarchies offline coming from gender difference or difference in social status or age, wealth, other things. So internet is, I mean, essential forum for maintenance of democracy. It is uh, one of the most lucid statement of the importance of, uh, or civilizational importance of uh, uh, internet and anonymous speech. To be uh, the devil's advocate, South Korea had quite a lot of trouble with anonymity in, on the internet. Manhunts against celebrities, online mobbing, hate groups such as Ilbe. How do you uh, work against these groups if there is you know, full anonymity on the internet? Uh, logically, there cannot be a full anonymity. Mm. Any voice, online or offline, can be tracked down to the person. Online real name law uh, was a mistake because uh, for the pretext of uh, tracking down few individuals uh, spreading illegal content, it put the burden on everybody to uh, speak only on real name basis. One of the big stories last year was the exodus of over 2 million users of Kakao Talk to an allegedly more secure instant messaging app called Telegraph. Um, it seems to me that search and seizure um, of Kakao Talk conversations had already happened for quite a long time. So why the sudden switch? What happened there? Uh, you mean Telegram, uh, Telegram. Oh, sorry, Telegram, yes. Yeah, Telegram. <laughs> yes, you are so right. As I said, if the government is interested in tracking down people spreading uh, illegal contents, the government can always do search and seizure, based on warrants, can do wiretapping. They have their own lawful investigative techniques to track down people. They don't need to put the burden on everybody to wear name tags whenever they speak, right? That was the problem with the real name law. And as I said, Talk and other uh, internet companies and telcos, they have been subject to and also have cooperated with these investigative techniques. Why did people respond so explosively to uh, this round of uh, government announcements? 
because the government announced that those searches and seizures can take place to all of you. What the government announced was that the prosecutors will create a special task force that's dedicated to cracking down on illegal content or defamatory content on cyberspace. That's fine. But add to that, the government said, our main purpose is to protect national unity and suppress those voices criticizing the government. Add to that, the government also said, we will act on the contents even when there's no one complaining, no one's calling that as defamatory. People started thinking, oh, what are the things, what are the statements online that the government can already know to be false so that they can start the investigation on? Well, the statements involving the government, because the government will know truth about themselves, right? So uh, any statements about the sinking of uh, uh, Chanan, uh, Chevrolet, the mad cow disease and American beef, for reverse project, privatization of uh, KTX, you know, on th those statements, and also statements about the sinking of Sewer Ferry. These statements, the government have claimed to know the truth, so they will go after these statements. On those topics, everybody has something one way or the other. So all of these people so far have lived in the security of the belief that search and seizure of uh, my email, search and seizure of uh, my uh, texting, uh, my chatting messages will not happen unless I do something shady, but we're now at the risk of uh, being searched and seized. So that's why they uh, you know, responded uh, so explosively. Search and seizure is quite common for serious crime, but mm -hmm. is it a novelty when it comes to defamation? Unfortunately, it's not. The PD notes producers when they were investigated, some of them were searched and seized as six months worth of, or seven months worth of their emails, including all private ones, of course. So the task force you mentioned will be granted, and I quote, preemptive investigation powers? Yes. Isn't that extremely dangerous? Because as you mentioned, after all, anyone could have written anything about these kind of topics. Where, where do you draw the line? Right. That's why people became so worried. Yeah, you also mentioned at, the, um, at an event organized by the uh, Asia Democracy Network that Korean civil society is not only under attack from government censors, but that a new threat to them is hate speech against activists, against minorities, even the victims of the civil disaster had to deal with that. Why is the government so keen on repressing bad language or critics against them, but uh, is not prosecuting more harshly hate speech communities such as Ilbe or others? I think that it will take time to do a proper analysis on the neutrality of prosecution uh, over uh, you know, liberal statements versus conservative statements. I think that hate speech in Korea is uh, becoming a threat to people's conviction on free speech because we don't have anti-discrimination law. Anti-discrimination law makes discriminatory conduct illegal and at the same time makes a speech contributing to the discriminatory conduct also illegal. Uh, if, if there is this uh, relatively clear uh, legal rule controlling speech uh, against the minorities, we will not have to use insert law or this broad uh, defamation laws. If Korea as uh, other quote-unquote uh, advanced countries develop anti-discrimination law, I think that uh, we can reduce the government's reliance on the broad defamation and insult laws. So because it's not defined what discrimination is, that's why it's not possible to go after these people. Right. Mm -hmm. Why did the Kakaotalk users who decided to leave the Kakaotalk service go for Telegram and not any other service like Line or WhatsApp? Number one, Kakaotalk has servers uh, within Korea which uh, will be subjugated to the jurisdiction of uh, warrants issued by Korean courts. So they wanted to use foreign services. There are many foreign services. Why Telegram? Well, Telegram offered encryption conversation options where the decryption keys 
reside only in the personal devices of the people communicating and not with the telegram not with its servers so even if telegram is presented uh, with a warrant telegram couldn't possibly uh, cooperate so that's why telegram was chosen over other ser foreign services you are heading a, a ngo called open net yes that is a um, very active very vocal force free speech uh, in uh, south korea can you maybe tell us a little bit about your activities and what are the let's say main issues or maybe even main lawsuits that you see in the future and that you are uh, involved in i'm sure there are many foreign listeners so uh, i'll uh, organize my priorities according to that i'm sure many of you had the difficulties in making purchases on Korean online malls because they require government issued certificates. The malls did that because the law allowed a government agency to require certain certain payment technologies for online transactions. One of the biggest achievements of OpenNet was to abolish that law. So now the agency cannot designate certain technology, whether it's government issued certificates or anything else, the technology. It should be neutral to all technologies. So, so, that, so that foreign purchasers can also make payments online. The other thing is, even after we brought down online real name law back in 2012, there are actually three other real name laws. So we have filed constitutional challenges against them. So uh, all people should present their real identities for viewing adult content online, for playing internet game online, for making statements uh, supporting or opposing a candidate during election campaign period. And it's not in the law, but by cartel of uh, the telcos, uh, also for getting a uh, mobile phone. If you visit Southeast Asia and then come to Korea, you will be surprised that you know, in Southeast Asia, you could just buy a USIM uh, at a you know, local uh, drink store and just put it in your phone and start using it. In Korea, you have to present passport, you have to wait three days. And all of that, all these uh, laws, all these real name laws are there to basically track people down, to make people non-anonymous so that the government can track you down. And uh, we think uh, it greatly undercuts the value that the internet can bring to our country, civilization. To conclude, KS, would you say that this regression maybe of free speech that we are seeing in South mm -hmm. Korea tells us something about South Korean democracy? Do you think the democratization process has not advanced enough or has it stalled? Is it even a regression? Or is it, are the, these two things maybe not that related? I think democracy is real and here. It's just that these uh, regressions on the government level are disrupting and dividing people. So more and more people are spending time, including me, spending time on not very constructive uh, things. One of the best tweets I saw uh, last year was this. History is uh, written by victors. So in Korea, what do losers write? The answer was tweets. That exchange, that imaginary exchange, really shows the status of free speech in Korea. History is composed of a mainstream text, you know, broadcasting, academic papers, government announcements, things like that. Now, those things are dominated by government censorship. And if you say things that are far-reaching and uh, become you know, effective critics, uh, you are put into jail. You become the target. So you end up writing small tidbits, tweets, under 140 characters. Democracy is well and alive in this lower tracks of uh, communication, but it's a shame that it's not built into something greater, something more powerful, like broadcasting or films and other things. Is this a generally generational issue? It seems that young people are now fed up with all these restrictions and most of the people in power 
probably started their ascension under the former dictatorship. Do you think these issues will die off <laughs> with the passing of generation? I hope so, but I think the difficulty is to persuade people, you know, deeply entrenched in this uh, confrontation thoughts of 60s and 70s. Well, it's difficult to wake them out of that thought and try to build a uh, system that's uh, more forward-looking. That also depends on how the country's relations with other countries develops, especially with North Korea. So we'll see. KS, thank you so much for being our guest today and for your time. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.